Now we'll discuss the appendicular skeleton. There are four parts. We'll talk about how the upper limb attaches to the axial skeleton. That's via the pectoral girdle. Then we'll go into details about the upper limb. Then the lower limb's attachment, pelvic girdle, to the axial skeleton. And then we'll continue with the lower limb. Appendicular skeleton are, are including our limbs and their attachment points. The appendicular skeleton includes the pectoral girdle. These are the bones listed for each of these regions that we will then go into in more detail. Beginning with the pectoral girdle, we see that it's made of two bones, the clavicle and the scapula, or no other commonly known as your collarbone and your shoulder blade. The view of the clavicle is that it is flat, extending from your shoulder, moving medially as it goes anterior. When looking at a single clavicular bone, in order to orient them, you want to look for the wide tapered end. That part will face out towards the shoulder, where the blunt end is going to be the more medial portion that goes against the sternum. When looking for the clavicle, you want to look for one side that is rougher. Notice on the upper image, we can see that it's much more smooth compared to this rough texture of the inferior view. That is because muscles, more muscles are attached to the inferior portion of the clavicle. The proper way to just name a feature is to name the feature of the bone. In this case, we have two clavicles. There's a right or left, so you have to indicate which one. So in this example, the blue would be the sternal end of the right clavicle, or the green is the acromial end of the right clavicle. And we can see the same for the left. We have the sternal end and the acromial end of the left clavicle. For the scapula, to orient yourself, if you have a, the opportunity to have a scapula in hand or you have a bone box with you while you're watching this, you want to grab the part that looks like a handle. That will face posterior, whereas the smooth surface is going to face against the body. It's actually going to be on the back and it'll be facing the ribs. So in this view, we can see from this posterior view the handle and is going to face posteriorly where the socket is going to face laterally, whether it's right or left. In this case, this is the anterior view. It's a smooth surface. This surface is actually going to be against the torso. So if you, this is, these portions are resting against the ribs. And again, we can see the right and left. In this image, we have a right scapula. So that's been inserted in the terminology portion. The list there on the left indicates the features that you need to know. So there is the glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa. That's going to form the cup of your shoulder socket. The acromion, also known as the acromial process, is actually the feature that you can feel on the top of your shoulder. The coracoid process, that is actually a little hook that goes right above the glenoid cavity. The spine of the scapula, of the right scapula in this case, is the handle that we referred to earlier. Then we have the inferior angle, that is the bottom pointy portion, as well as the medial and lateral borders indicated in blue and in green. And then finally is the subscapular fossa, which is the smooth surface that presses against the torso along just posterior to the ribs. Here are some images of the left scapula. Pause this and try to name the features indicated on the last slide. Here we see the glenoid cavity of the left scapula, the acromion of the left scapula, the coracoid process of the left scapula, the spine of the left scapula, as well as the borders, lateral border, medial border, as well as the inferior angle of the left scapula. Then finally, the subscapular fossa. These are all the features color coded to match hopefully what you were to answer earlier. On this image, we can see the coracoid process, the acromial process here, we can also see the acromial end of the clavicle. We can see the sternal end of the clavicle. We can see all of this is going to be the subscapular fossa. And we could see this would be our glenoid cavity. 
For the pectoral girdle, you should know the two features of the clavicle and what it articulates with. And you should know the features of the scapula and its articulations, as well as using the proper terminology when identifying these on an image. Now we'll move on to the upper limb. The humerus has a rounded head and that's going to point superiorly. Um, the rounded portion is going to face medially because that's going into the shoulder joint against that glenoid cavity. When we look at the distal end of the humerus, notice the scooped out end, that portion that has a dip into it is going to be the posterior surface. The features listed here on the left are ones you need to identify on the humerus. In this example, we'll use a left humerus. We have the head, the rounded portion in purple, followed by the anatomical neck, which is just at the rim of the head, which would be the end of the joint socket itself. There actually is a surgical neck that would be located here that's used obviously for surgical purposes, but the true anatomical neck is imitated there in a red line. Then we have more on this anterior surface, we can see in green a knobby portion known as the greater tubercle and a smaller knobby portion known as the lesser tubercle. And between them, identified by the pink line, is known as the intertubecular groove, also known as the bicipital groove because one of the tendons from your biceps brachii goes through here. Then we have a rough surface about the medial lateral portion of the humerus that's known as the deltoid tuberosity. And this is where your shoulder muscle or your deltoid muscle attaches. These are the features of the more proximal portion of the humerus. Now let's look distally. We have both the medial and lateral epicondyles. Epicondyle means these ridges above a lower rounded surface. So the green arrow indicates the lateral epicondyle, and then we see a much more prominent medial epicondyle that you can feel yourself on your own arm if you run your thumb down the medial side of your upper arm, the widest portion you can feel that medial epicondyle. Then the rounded odd surfaces at the far distal end, we see the trochlea, and it looks a bit like a sideways spool of thread. The capitulum is a more circular portion. And then on the posterior surface, we can see the olecranon fossa, and you can also see portions of the trochlea and the capitulum from this view as well. Here's a closer up view of the trochlea itself. This is the portion that our ulna is going to pivot on when we flex and extend our forearm. Then we can see the capitulum, the rounded head. This is the portion that our radius will rotate upon when we're turning our palm up to hold a cup of soup or over to pour it out. These are the two together. Now let's look at the ulna. The concave mouth portion, that's going to fit right into the trochlea of the humerus. That's going to face anterior. And also notice it has this little dip portion right here. That will always face lateral because that's where the head of the radius will fit. We can see that identified here in blue where the head of the radius will fit right into this little cup portion. So that will always face lateral. The right ulna we can see here from different views. So to name the features we have the olecranon process of the right ulna in orange the trochlear notch, which is the mouth portion in blue. Then we see that lower lip area, which is known as the coronoid process in green. And then that area that the radius will articulate with is over here I put in red, is identified in pink on the image, is the radial notch. And then finally, at the far distal end, we have the styloid process. Here are features of the ulna with all the views represented. The proximal portion of the radius looks like a golf tee. This is the part that will articulate in that notch along the ulna. Also know, notice the distal end of the radius is very wide in opposition to the narrow portion of the ulna in the distal end. 
So to orient the radius, you'll notice if you lay it on the table, you'll see one area that's scooped up, and that scooped up side is going to face anterior. Then the pointy end, we see identified in green, is going to be lateral. That's going to point actually towards your thumb if you're in anatomical position. And then the medial side has this cupped indentation indicated by the blue arrow, and that's where that small tapered end of the ulna will fit against. So the right radius we have, we can see all the features indicated here from all orientations. So we have the head of the radius in pink, radial tuberosity in blue, the ulnar notch in the distal portion in green, and the pointy thick styloid process that forms the outside of your wrist in purple. Here are those features indicated from all the views. We'll recap some of these features looking at some x-rays. So we can see the head of the humerus have its anatomical neck. We can actually see the greater tubercle there. You don't really see the rough part, but a little bit right in here is going to be your deltoid tuberosity. We can see this rounded portion is actually the capitulum. We know this because it has the head of the radius pressed up against it. We can actually see that mouth or trochlear notch of the ulna that would be going around the trochlear region of the humerus. Here's a more close-up view where we can see the head of the radius right here rotating around the capitulum or rotating against. We see the trochlear notch, the olecranon process of the ulna. We can see the distal end of the humerus, again the head of the radius. We have the radial notch of the ulna right here. We have the radial tuberosity of the radius located here. We have a really nice view of the trochlea of the humerus here, as well as the capitulum of the humerus, our medial epicondyle of the humerus, and our lateral epicondyle. In this image of the forearm bones, the radius and the ulna, again we see the head of the radius, the radial tuberosity, both of these are on the radius, this is the styloid process of the radius, and this is the ulnar notch. Medial epicondyle of the humerus, we can see the coronoid process of the ulna, the radial notch of the ulna. Ulna is really small styloid process. On to the wrist, hands, and fingers. You have eight carpal bones. You will not need to identify which bones exactly are which, but you do need to know them from a list and be able to identify them as carpal bones. In the hand, we have metacarpals, and the fingers are made up of bones that are called phalanges. The carpal bones are indicated here. We have the scaphoid, lunate, triquetrium, and pisiform. Those are located more proximally against the radius and more distally against the metacarpals are trapezium, trapezoid bone, capitate, and hamate. We can see them named and identified on this x-ray from a palmar surface view. One thing I'd like you to notice is the distance between the ulna and the wrist bones and the styloid process is very tiny on the ulna. And so the majority of your wrist is actually made up of the radius, and you can see how the styloid process of the radius really cups nicely and helps to stabilize your wrist. The metacarpal bones are the bones of the palm of your hand. They're numbered by Roman numerals starting from the thumb going towards the bones proximal to the pinky. The phalanges, there are 14 of them. That's because there are three on your fingers and only two on your thumb. So for the upper limb, you should know the features of the humerus and what, what it articulates with, the features of the ulna and its articulations, features of the radius and its articulations. You should be able to name the carpal bones. You should be able to identify the metacarpal bones and name them by, in their proper order as well as identify phalanges of the hand. For the pelvic girdle, the ossococcus is actually three bones put together. 
So we will name them as three individual bones, but they are fused together. To orient yourself to an osacoxa, if you have a box of bones with you, this time you have this flared fan part here, and that's going to be superior. You're gonna hold that up, hold that by your hand. Then you have this rough portion, that's going to go posterior, that's going to go against your sacrum. And this rounded part here is actually what you're going to be sitting on. So that's pointing inferiorly. And then this point here, as they come into this narrow medial area, this will be pointing towards the middle. And then the hole right here is going to be facing anterior. The socket, also known as the acetabulum, is lateral. So based on our view here, we can identify this as a right osacoxa. We have this upper area, we have this going to point anteriorly, and this will be lateral. And this is posterior. So on this right osacoxa, here are different views. This is what a left osacoxa would look like. The three bones of the osacoxa are made up of the ilium, which is the upper fan portion, the ischium, which is the posterior portion that you'll be sitting on, and the pubis, which is going to be the front part of your pelvis. All three of them come together to form the socket known as the acetabulum. Another common feature of the osacoxa is the obturator foramen, which is the hole that's sort of highlighted there in yellow. This is formed by the two bones, the ischium and the pubis. So let's begin with the ilium. We are using a left osacoxa in this example. So the ridge line is known as the iliac crest. This is what you would put your hands on if you're resting your hands on your hips. Then indicated in this U or inverted U is the greater sciatic notch. That will be posterior. And then the inner basin portion is known as the iliac fossa. We can see based on the arrows, I have the color coded ones for the anterior. The in red, the anterior superior iliac spine, and then the anterior inferior iliac spine. We have its parallels on the posterior side. There's a superior and inferior, although these are difficult to palpate. You can easily palpate your anterior superior iliac spine. Now onto the ischium. We have this lower little jutting out ridge identified in green as the ischial spine. And then the tiny blue notch below it is the lesser sciatic notch. And then the large bulbous portion that would actually be what you sit on is known as the ischial tuberosity. And then the ischium only goes halfway up this beam of bone as it goes towards the pubis. So this lower half is known as the ischial ramus, identified in purple. On this right pubis or right osacoxa, there are only two features. We have the inferior ramus, which is more medial than the ischial ramus, which is more medial than the ischial ramus, and then we have the superior ramus. When we compare male and female pelvises, this is the list, but it's a lot easier to show you. On this sketch, we can see the male has a much narrower pubic arch, where the female, that pubic arch is much wider. Then the ultimate pelvic basin for the males is much narrower than the wider pelvic basin for females. And even the way that the iliac fossa fans out is much more in females versus it being a bit more vertical in males. In this view, we can see the male pelvis here, as well as the male osacoxa there. The other one is then the female. So then we can see that the pelvic basin in the male is much smaller than it is in the female. We can see the subpubic angle indicated in green is much narrower in the male compared to the female. We can see that the iliac crest, the distance from one portion of the iliac crest to the other is much narrower in the male. Not so obvious in this particular image. Um, the sacrum and coccyx are less curved in the female. So we can see it's much wider open here where the curvature of the sacrum and coccyx actually will obstruct the outflow track. 
And then the sciatic notch over here we can see is much wider in the female in comparison to the male. Here's an x-ray. This is a male pelvis. We can see how narrow this inlet is and we can see the pubic arch is fairly narrow as well. Here for the female, we can see the inlet is much wider. We can definitely see a wider angle between the iliac crest as well as this pubic arch is much greater. As well. This is another view of the female, the posterior view. Again, we can see the greater pubic crest. We can also tell it's a female because we can see her IUD right there. Another view, this is the, a view of looking at the outlet itself. So this is the outlet that a baby would come out. So we could see it's a much wider opening than a male would offer. This is a pediatric male. So it's, just, it's not necessarily here as far as identifying sex differences, but I did want you to identify and see that these are remnants, so it's a young man, so the three parts of the ossococcus have yet to fuse together. We can actually see the ischium and the pubis have indeed fused together, but we have yet to have the ilium fuse in there. We can also see, and we can see the growth plate here as well. So in the pelvic girdle, you should know the bones of the ossococcus and features of the pelvic girdle as a whole. Then you should know the individual features of the ilium, ischium, and pubis, also using the proper terminology. For the sake of time, I didn't name each one in the proper format. I just identified where the features were. And then you should know the differences between the male and female pelvis. On to the lower limb. We'll begin with the femur, which is your thigh bone. So the rounded head of the femur is going to be proximal and pointed medially because that's what's going to go into the socket that is the acetabulum. We have two smooth surfaces that are distal. The smooth rounded surfaces are known as condyles. Notice on the two smooth surfaces there is actually a notch between the two that makes a bit of a U. That notch is going to face posteriorly. So in this left femur image, we can see the head is identified in red, the neck is in yellow, then we have the greater trochanter and lesser trochanters. These are comparable to the tubercles of the humerus, but they're larger, so they're called trochanters on the femur. Then midway down the posterior surface of the femur identified in purple is the gluteal tuberosity where your gluteal muscle, gluteus maximus muscle attaches. On the distal surface, we can see identified by the arrows, a medial in green and lateral in blue epicondyles. So those are those wide ridge lines before it drops down into the smooth condylar surface. And then the smooth condylar surface, we have a medial condyle and a lateral condyle identified in green and blue respectively. And finally, on the posterior surface, we have that intercondylar fossa, which is right between the two inside that notch. So on the proximal end of the femur, we can actually see the greater trochanter here. We can see the neck here, a part of the head in the acetabulum, and we see the lesser trochanter right there. The patella is a sesamoid bone that's essentially laminated in a tendon ligament. So a tendon is muscle to bone. So that's why the blue portion is known as the quadriceps tendon. Once it goes through the patella itself, or the patella is embedded in this connective tissue, the portion that goes from the patella to the tibia is bone to bone, and therefore it's known as the, a ligament and called the patellar ligament when really it's just one continuous sheet of connective tissue with the patella embedded in between. The tibia is your large shin bone. And to orient that, we want to see the wide flat surface is going to be the top. And then it has a really pointy knobby portion and that's going to face anterior. And then on the distal end, notice this hook down here that is going to face medial. So that's actually what people refer to as your ankle bone. Your medial part of your ankle bone that protrudes out is actually the distal end of your tibia. So here are the different views of the right tibia. 
we can see the intercondylar eminence, which is this really prominent ridge that actually will go between the two condyles of the femur when we look at the knee. The tibial tuberosity is this rough portion on the anterior surface. That's where the patellar ligament attaches to. And then your medial ankle bone that people like to commonly call it is actually known as the medial malleolus of the right tibia in this case. The fibula, this one actually is the most difficult one. This along with the clavicle are the, the two most difficult to orient if you have a bone box with you and you're following along. So if you grab your fibula, it's a very long, narrow bone. The more bulbous rounded end I have identified in pink is going to be proximal. And then you have a little flatter, a little more tapered end that's going to be distal. Then when you look at that flat tapered end, you'll notice that it kind of following that blue arrow points down into one direction. It goes from anterior to posterior. So in this case, this looks like it is going to be a left fibula in that we're going to, this would be on your left side because it's going anterior is going to be higher up than the posterior part. And the smooth part will be outside um, this will face the most lateral versus the smooth part will face the most lateral where this rough part that's actually cupping against bones is going to be facing medially. So this is the left fibula unmarked. The only features that you need to identify are the head, which will be the proximal portion, and the distal portion is the lateral malleolus or your outside ankle bone as is commonly referred to. So together, your lower leg is made up of the tibia and the fibula, and these are the features that you need to know for each. On an x-ray, we can see the tibia, we see a nice intercondylar eminence. The tibial tuberosity would be about in this location. We can see it much nicer over here. You can actually see here's the patella, and the patellar ligament would connect from the patella to that tibial tuberosity. In this image, we can see a really nice view of a condyle of the femur. We can see the plateau portion of the tibia, as well as the plateau over here, and the condyles of the femur. This is the head of the fibula. This is the lateral malleolus of the fibula. We have a medial malleolus of the tibia. Then on to the ankle and foot. We have the tarsal bones, which form part of our ankle, which is this part, and then the proximal part of the foot. Then we have the foot proper, which is our metatarsal bones, and then finally our toes. These are more nicely represented by the colors here. The tarsal bones, the only two that I will ask you to be responsible for in lab will be the talus and the calcaneus. The calcaneus is your heel bone proper that you can feel. The talus is actually the one that's going to articulate with the tibia as you lift your toes up and down as you pivot your foot that way. You do need to know the name, the cuboid, navicular, and the three cuneiform and identify them as part of the tarsal bones, but I won't ask you them specifically to identify them specifically. Metatarsal bones are going to be the long toes in your foot. They are starting from Roman numeral number one by your big toe, moving out to five. That's going to be proximal to your pinky toe. And then finally, we still have the same number of bones in the phalanges of our toes than we did with our fingers, but we have 14. So again, the big toe has two bones while the other toes have three bones. So for the lower limb, you should know about the femur, what it articulates with, as well as specific features. The patella, and you should know about the ligament and a tendon that attaches to. You should know the features for the tibia and fibula, as well as what they articulate with. You should know the tarsal bones and its articulations. You should know then the, what the metatarsal bones are, as well as the phalanges of the feet.